Welcome to the first in this series of video supports for healthcare workers experiencing menopause. My name is Siobhan Patton, General Manager in Health and Wellbeing. The working group behind this initial response to the subject of menopause is made up of representations from the Community Healthcare Area, Cavan, Donegal, Leitrim, Monaghan and Sligo, colleagues from Letterkenny University Hospital in the Sealtha Group and colleagues from Cavan General Hospital in the RCSI Hospital Group all of whom have brought both their expertise and their lived experience to this working group. The series of videos we have produced are as follows. This first one telling you what our staff told us about their experience of menopause and its effects on them in the workplace. Expert information from Dr. Sarah Brennan, GP in Carrigart, which follows this. A video from a senior physiotherapist in Letterkenny University Hospital advising on pelvic floor health and bone health an expert input on the psychological and emotional effects of the menopause and information and strategies on how to deal with this. An input on smoking in the menopause and information on how to access services. It is the intention that this series of videos is the first step in providing information and advice for staff, leading towards a healthier menopause and putting in place the building blocks for a healthy and happy older years. Focus groups were held with both hospital-based staff and community-based staff and all staff groupings were covered. We also received a number of written submissions from people who were unable to attend one of the focus groups. The underpinning message that we received was that all staff are very pleased that an open conversation on the subject of the menopause has started. In the focus groups, we asked the following questions. What symptoms have you experienced? What impact? Have your symptoms had in the workplace? What would help you? This series of videos has been developed as a response to what our staff told us in the focus groups. I would like to thank all of those who participated in the focus groups for sharing their sometimes difficult and painful experiences. Thank you. So hi, my name is Sarah Brennan. I work as a GP in Donegal. And as part of my day-to-day -day work, I see all patients and I also see women who present to me with symptoms of the menopause. So an overview of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my story because it's different and interesting, I think. We'll look at culture in the menopause. We'll do an overview of the menopause, what the different stages are, when it happens and why it happens. We'll also then look at the different symptoms that people present with during the menopause. We're also going to chat about what a woman and her GP might do to recognise the menopause. We'll look at different medical treatments and non-medical treatments which are available. We'll then look at different risks um, that might be associated with taking hormone replacement therapy. We'll look at lifestyle measures that we can adopt ourselves to help ourselves during the menopause and perimenopause. And then some take home messages and to end we'll just look at some resources that we can find on the internet in regards to information and support groups. So just a little bit about my menopause story. So this all happened um, um, with our fifth child who was breastfeeding at the time and he was probably breastfeeding about two years at that stage when I noticed that I started developing symptoms of the menopause. Um, with breastfeeding, it can suppress your ovaries and stop them functioning and producing the hormones that, that they produce. Um, and during this period of time, I realized that it, would have, it was having a really negative impact on me and my day-to-day -day life and my capacity to be a mom and also to work as a GP. Um, so I started taking HRT and it had um, a dramatic in, impact on me and, and how how my life then progressed from there. So I've learned experientially from having the menopause myself um, and also um, through, through my work as a doctor. Um, and I feel that this experiential learning has been really important for me to help me deliver care to my patients. That's, that's really appropriate. So to move on and look at a little bit about culture in the menopause, and, and it's interesting th to consider that around the world um, there are different experiences of the menopause in some cultures it's it's really well embraced and revered actually um, to go from that period of your life where you're menstruating having periods producing eggs getting pregnant and having babies to one where where that's not um, really a very prominent part of our lives 
So this is interesting when the culture is that way, that tends to be more accepted to be in the postmenopausal period. Whereas in Western cultures, maybe it isn't as accepted as it can be in other cultures, more indigenous cultures. So it's really something that we should um, question and, and look at and, and try and understand ourselves, how we relate to the menopause. Do we embrace it as an op a time of opportunity um, where we can have a different phase of our lives um, and, and behave in different ways? And this book is an interesting book and it really helps us to, to see that period of our life as an important um, opportunity for us. Um, so it's worth considering this and exploring it. Um, and when you kind of think about it um, and think that previously, you know, hundreds of years ago, the age of the menopause was around 57. Now it's age 51. Um, but back then, the average life expectancy was about 57 as well for, for women. But now it's, it's much older than that and in the 80s. So we're now looking at about 30 years of our lives being spent in this postmenopausal phase. Um, and thus it, it becomes a really important part of our life where we can we have so much opportunity and we can give back to society. So, so these are things that we, we should consider. And maybe being on um, HRT or hormone replacement therapy is an option for us to help us to maximally live that period of our lives. So what is the menopause? So the menopause is when our ovaries stop producing eggs. Um, during the period of our lives, when we're having our periods, we have a certain number of ovums in our ovaries that we produce on a monthly basis. Um, when we, when the number of eggs diminishes and the ovaries become less responsive to the hormones that our brain produces, then over time we don't produce these eggs and with that our ovaries stop producing hormones such as estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. And it's with this that our periods stop coming. Um, this happens over a normal period of about 10 years in our lifetime, between ages of 45 and 55 years of age. Um, it can happen earlier than that when it's seen as early menopause um, between the ages of 40 and 45. And if it happens before the age of 40, it's known as premature ovarian insufficiency. This is more common than we would think with one in 100 women experiencing this. Um, it may be due to different medical um, eventualities that happen, such as having to undergo surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. It can all be, all also be associated with different um, diseases that we get, such as autoimmune diseases. Um, and it can also happen when periods stop due to illnesses such as anorexia. Um, the periods can stop or be suppressed by different um, activities as well. And one such activity would be breastfeeding. And this tends to happen in, in older mothers um, who might be you know, in their 40s or so. It can also happen with younger um, women who are taking hormonal contraceptive, contraceptives, such as the progesterone only pill. Um, and in this instance, it stops their period. And with that, there's a reduction in the production of these hormones as well from our ovaries, um, which can lead to symptomatology such as those experienced in the, the perimenopausal and menopausal period. So if you look to the right of this slide, you can see that there are the different stages of the menopause. We have the, the pre-menopause, um, which is when there are no menopausal symptoms and when people are experiencing normal, for them, periods. Then as time goes on, we can move into the perimenopausal um, phase um, where we kind of notice maybe that there are menopausal symptoms there and that our periods might be changing. So they might be um, becoming more spaced out or shorter spaces between them, or maybe the, the bleeds themselves selves are becoming longer or shorter um, or heavier. Um, so there'll be different symptoms associated with um, having your perimenopause. So the periods are still ongoing, but we can experience those symptoms of the menopause that I'll go into in a, in a few slides later. Then the menopause is when we stop producing eggs and stop having our periods. And this can vary from woman to woman. Um, in when we're under the age of 50, usually it's two years after we stop having a period. And when we're over the age of 50, it's a year after we stop having a period. 
Um, it, it is associated as well with menopausal or perimenopausal symptoms. Um, and that's what alerts us to, to us being in that phase of, of menstruation or non-menstruation as it is. And then the postmenopausal uh, phase is when we have gone through this period and we have had no production of eggs for a year after um, the age of 50 and two years before the age of 50. So this is a diagram to help us understand um, what happens during the menopause. So you can see here on the vertical line, the, where the estrogen level is written there, that as you go along the horizontal line, you can see this red line and that represents the levels of estrogen. And over time, you can see that they're falling. In the first phase there, that's the pre-menopausal phase, we have normal levels of estrogen. As we move towards the perimenopausal phase, when our ovaries are kind of, you know, they're kind of getting a little bit slower than they had been before that. And they're not as responsive to the hormones that come from our brain. And we can see that over time, the levels of estrogen are fluctuating and reducing over time. Until then, the menopausal time at around age 51, you can see that the levels of estrogen are reducing and are at their lowest level. And at this level, they will continue for the rest of our lives. When we look at that in a little bit more detail and consider what happens during the perimenopausal period and the menopausal period, we can see that these spikes, the blue spikes that are vertical, represent increasing levels um, of estrogen. And these come in flashes or flushes as we call them. And this is when our ovaries are making a big effort to kind of regain their function, where they release a huge amount of estrogen at one time. And this is when we experience hot flushes or sweats. And these are characteristic symptoms of the menopause. And our ovaries can continue responding in this way to the stimulation from our brain over a period of time from two to four to even 12 years from our perimenopausal period until we become, um, until during our postmenopausal period. And just to put it into perspective, here on the left beside the the vertical axis, you can see that, that puberty is written there. And that wee arrow above it represents our estrogen levels as they increase in puberty and then come up to the levels that are normal during our normal menstruating period. So with these fluctuations in estrogen over our lifetime and during the perimenopausal and menopausal period, we will experience different symptoms. These symptoms vary between person and person, um, and there are many symptoms that are reported. This scale is called the Green Climateric Scale, and it has a list of 21 symptoms that can be commonly experienced in the menopause. They're broken into different symptom sets. One of them is those of psychological symptoms, of which there are two other different sets, one of symptoms that relate to feelings of anxiety and the other are symptoms that relate to feelings of depression. There are also a set of symptoms that are called somatic symptoms and these are symptoms that are felt in the body and are physical symptoms. And then there are also the vasomotor symptoms that I've spoken about before and these would be the hot flushes that people experience. There are also um, other symptoms and the other one that's there is sexual interest symptoms. When a person fills in this form and gets a score of 11 or above, it is indicative of symptoms um, of the menopause that are causing them difficulty. But that's not necessary. If a person has a symptom such as hot flushes and night sweats, where their sleep is dramatically affected um, and they feel tired and unrested on a day-to-day -day basis, this symptom itself is hugely debilitating and on its own would be indicative of quite a symptomatic perimenopause or menopause and would indicate potentially the need for hormone replacement therapy. Other symptoms that aren't gone into in detail in this scale are those of the genitourinary symptoms of the menopause, which we'll go into again in detail. But why do we get all these symptoms? Why is a lack of estrogen causing us this much difficulty? Estrogen is an essential female hormone. It causes our vessels to, to dilate. Um, and this 
in itself reduces our blood pressure and also reduces the effect of blood pressure on our vessels, which can be quite damaging. Um, Oestrogen itself also produces nitric oxide, which itself causes vasodilation um, and is also a significant anti-inflammatory uh, mediator. So this means that it reduces inflammation throughout our body. And of course, if the oestrogen is absent, we have more inflammation in our body and thus have more symptoms of inflammation in our body. Oestrogen also helps oxytocin in our body work more effectively. We know that oxytocin is a really important hormone. It contributes to feelings of well-being and helps improve our mood and self-esteem and helps with bonding. And when we don't have oestrogen in our body, those effects of oxytocin are reduced. Oxytocin also helps reduce cortisol in our body. And we know that cortisol is a stress hormone and that it has a significant negative impact in our body when it's increased and sustained over time um, at this increased level. So these are some of the physical symptoms of the menopause. This list is not a finite list. Um, many people can experience other symptoms, but this is quite um, a detailed list of a lot of symptoms that people may get. So, being all individual, we will all experience different symptoms and it's important to be aware of the different symptoms so that we can recognise them in ourselves in our perimenopause and a menopausal period. So one of the common ones that, that we know about are those of the hot flushes or flashes. People can call them different names where we get this sudden feeling of heat in our body. Night sweats where our sweat glands are stimulated and we produce a lot of sweat which causes our clothes to become wet and we need to change our clothes and we can become very cold then when we produce all the sweat and this has a significant negative impact on our sleep. Um, another is those of heart palpitations um, which can also disturb our sleep and cause feelings of anxiety during the day. There are many other symptoms such as headaches, dizziness, aches and pains and stiffness in our joints and in our muscles. Bloating and IBS symptoms become worse during the perimenopause and menopausal time. People complain of weight gain, ringing in their ears. And there's a big long list there that people can look at and, and see if they recognize any of those symptoms in themselves. So this is a little bit more detail on those specific genitourinary symptoms that people complain about in the perimenopausal and menopausal period. As time goes on, these symptoms become worse as we are, uh, the amount of estrogen in our body lowers over time. In our genital area, there are many receptors to the estrogen molecule. Um, this has an impact on our physiology and our anatomy, so, so how things are down there and how they function. This can lead to vaginal dryness and itchiness or burning sensations in, in our perineal area. It can cause vaginal discharge and it can lead to difficulties during intercourse. It can also have an impact on our desire to have sexual intercourse, as is demonstrated by low libido. Um, and it can also cause difficulties with incontinence where people complain of urinary incontinence and faecal incontinence. It's also associated with loosening of the ligaments and muscles in that area, which can lead to pelvic organ prolapse, where we feel something coming down, such as our bladder, the womb, or the, vagi the vaginal walls. It also has an impact on our bladder and in can cause us to feel this urgency to want to pass urine, even though there may not be much urine in the bladder. And it also is associated with an increased risk of developing urinary tract infections. So this is a little bit about the psychological symptoms that people experience, and they can be broken up to, into emotional and cognitive symptoms. Um, people can feel increased anxiety, and increased feelings of panic and nervousness when they're going through the perimenopause and in the menopausal time. Also, we're susceptible to feeling low mood and feeling down and feeling like we don't have interest in the normal um, events and 
you know, activities that we would have had before. We can also feel tearfulness um, and it can lead us to have a feeling of loss of confidence. We can also feel irritability and can have mood swings, um, which can have a negative impact on our day-to-day -day life. Cognitive capacity can be affected as well by the perimenopause and menopausal periods. People can complain of brain fog, where they just find an inability to think clearly or find word finding skills are affected. Also, people describe memory difficulties where they can't remember things that they would normally have had no problem remembering. And concentration can also be affected. Mm -hmm. So how do we know we're having the menopause or we're going through this perimenopausal or menopausal time in our lives? So it's really based on these symptoms and because we're all individuals um, it's our job to, to have a look at our life on a day to day basis and explore what we're experiencing and whether this might be um, our perimenopause that we're going through. So if we're over the age of 45 and we have these symptoms and our periods are changing, then that would be um, diagnostic of going through the perimenopausal period. If we're under age 45, it's also based on symptom set. But because 25% of women will have no symptoms, it's important then to explore how our periods are as well. And if we have changes in our periods over a period of four months, then it would be important to seek help from a doctor, from your GP, and blood tests can be done in this situation where we're under age 40. These tests are done um, now and then they should be done in four to six weeks time um, again repeated to see if there's any changes that might indicate we're going through the perimenopause but this isn't necessary we don't need to have abnormal blood tests but it is helpful so we're going through the perimenopausal period or we're in our postmenopausal period and we'd like to get some help there are ways of helping us with this phase in our lives um, through non-medical means, so where we're not taking medicines prescribed by a doctor. Um, there are psychological interventions and cognitive behavioural therapy, mindfulness, relaxation therapy would all be seen as psychological interventions where we're helping ourselves be more accepting and understanding and non-judgmental of this phase that we're going through. And that allows us um, space and um, peace and stillness to be able to transition through this period in our lives. There are other therapies that can help us as well. Um, acupuncture, homeopathy, aromatherapy, reflexology can also, help, um, to, for, uh, can also help us to go through this phase of our lives. We can also take supplements. It's well known now that our foods, because of how we use the land, don't have as many nutrients and vitamins as they would have had previously. So taking supplements can help us as well to go through this perimenopausal and menopausal period of our lives. B vitamins can be very helpful, especially vitamin B6, which helps with cognitive function, insomnia, and also with the hot flushes that people experience. Vitamin D and calcium is really important because we know when our estrogen levels drop that we can start to break down our bone more quickly. We know that the maximum bone density is um, experienced when we're about age 30, and after that period of time, the bone density decreases um, and it incre this decrease is more dramatic in the perimenopausal and menopausal period. So ensuring adequate intake of vitamin D and calcium is really important. Magnesium taken at night time can help with the insomnia. Um, it also is an important mineral in bones as well. Um, and it can also help with the hot flushes as well. And then there are other licensed menopausal supplements that people can take. There are many on the market um, and each one of them is good as the next. Um, and we can experiment with them and see which ones suit us. Other alternatives to HRT, which would not be prescribed by your doctor, are black cohosh, but we need to be careful with that because it can affect our liver 
And if we have any liver disease, we should not take it. Red clover, ginkgo biloba, and St. John's worth. And St. John's worth is a known antidepressant, which we can buy over the counter. It can have a negative impact on our liver as well, and it can break down, it can cause our liver to break down other medications quickly. So it's important that we discuss this with our pharmacist and explain if we're on any other medications so that they can see if there's any negative interaction. So there's also medical treatment. And it's really important to understand that medical management is only an adjunct to lifestyle management. Managing our lives and how we live is the most important way that we can help us to transition through this perimenopausal and menopausal time in our lives. And if we choose to take medical treatment in conjunction with lifestyle management, there are different hormones that we take to replace the hormones that we're missing in our body. So estrogen is the main hormone that we take. And for those people without a womb, they only need to take estrogen. There's no need for them to take any progestogen. We can use this in a patch form, in a gel form, in a spray or in a tablet. And then if we have any of the genitourinary symptoms of the menopause, we can also use it um, in our vagina as well. For those women with a womb, like I said, or who have a history of endometriosis, where we have womb fragments that are outside of the womb and that might lie inside of the tummy, it's important for women with, with those stories to take progestion as well. And this protects the lining of the womb or the endometrial deposits from the proliferative effect of estrogen, which means that each estrogen stimulates these cells. And when we take progestion with it, it helps reduce the stimulation of these cells. And this helps reduce any negative consequences of estrogen. So we can take this progestion by mouth or we can use it um, by putting it into the vagina as well. We can also take progestion in the form of the marina coil. This is a really handy way for us to get the progestion that we need when we're using estrogen. And it also helps us to have contraception, which will prevent us from getting pregnant. And in relation to the different types of progestion, depending on whether we're getting our period or not, we can use the progestion in a cyclical way where we take a break of 14 days so that we can allow ourselves to have a bleed or we can use it in a continuous way when we haven't had periods for two years if we're under the age of 50 or for one year if we're over the age of 50 so that we take the progestion every single day so that we won't be getting any bleeds. So why would we take hormone replacement therapy? Well, it helps with the symptoms that we were talking about earlier on. Um, and this is really important. It helps us to lead a normal life um, as best we can going through this phase of our lives. It also helps reduce risks that we might be presented with in our perimenopausal period, such as softening of the bones or osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease such as angina and heart attacks, colon cancer, dementia and cognitive functioning. It also helps reduce osteoarthritis, obesity and type 2 diabetes. So all in all, when HRT is started within 10 years of having a last period and under the age of 60, it does reduce significant illness over our lifetime. So when can't we take hormone replacement therapy. So if we have a current history of any breast, ovarian or womb cancer, it's important not to use HRT. If we have any active liver disease, we should also not use HRT. If we have any undiagnosed breast lumps or abnormal vaginal bleeding, we have to wait until they've been investigated and all is okay for us to start HRT. Sometimes we can develop clots in our calves or in our lungs and if that's the case, we shouldn't use HRT as well. If we've had a heart attack recently, we also shouldn't use HRT. And if we have uncontrolled or untreated high blood pressure, 
we should wait until it's controlled to start HRT. If anyone has any of these active illnesses and is interested in starting HRT or starting other options, they will be referred to a complex menopause clinic. Saying that, we don't have one yet in the Northwest, but in time, in the last year, three have been set up around Ireland, and I would predict that one will be set up here pretty soon. So there are some disadvantages of taking HRT and risks. Um, they are very tiny or negligible, um, but it's important that we consider them. Once we start HRT, we could potentially be looking at a lifelong medication, and that's something that we have to consider. Are we happy to, to be taking a medication for the rest of our lives? It does increase the risk of clots if taken by mouth, but there is an option to use patches and gels which do not increase this risk. It also can increase the risk of womb cancer, but this is why we use the progestions to help reduce that risk. And with the use of utrogestin and dufestan, that helps reduce that risk. So there is also a theoretical increased risk of breast cancer. It's interesting because for women who have no womb and take estrogen only HRT, they don't have any increased risk. If you have your menopause before the age of 51 and you start HRT to treat that, it does not increase your risk of breast cancer combined estrogen and progestion HRT. When they look at the studies, there is an increased pickup of breast cancer, but over time, there's no increased death from breast cancer. And that's also interesting. This infographic is a very useful tool that we use in general practice to help people understand their relative risks. You can see here that this is looking at the incidence of breast cancer in a thousand women aged between 50 and 59 over a five year period. And we can see that when people take combined hormone replacement therapy from 23 cases, this increases to 27 cases. When people have an increased weight of over um, 30 um, as a BMI, there is an additional 24 cases of breast cancer, um, which is quite significant. And we can also see that if we're consuming two units of alcohol per day, this also increases our risk of breast cancer by five cases. And similarly with people who smoke, there's an increased risk of three cases in that period of time. So this is really important to help us to understand that these are all relative risks and we can compare them and we can look at how we can modify our lifestyles to be able to reduce our risk of getting breast cancer. And if you look there at the bottom, you can see how the incidence of breast cancer reduces when we do over two and a half hours of moderate exercise per week by seven cases in this five year period. So this really emphasizes that lifestyle changes are really important around the perimenopausal period. And this brings us to Dr. Rajan Chatterjee's book, The Four Pillar Plan, where he talks about how, how we move, how we sleep, relax and eat can all have a significant impact on our life and our well-being. So when you look at it in a little bit more detail, I've just highlighted the aspects that make a lot of sense to me. So we can make a habit of moving and movement snacking is what he calls it, where we are conscious of parking away from our um, place of work and walking briskly to work. And that would be an example. And in order to help us improve our sleep, we can enjoy caffeine free beverages as opposed to those with caffeine, which have a significant negative impact on sleep quality. In relation to relaxation, a daily practice of stillness or meditation or mindfulness can help us to, to really um, relax and allow our nervous system to go into a state of non-arousal, which is really important for healing. And then in relation to eating, we eat a lot of processed foods. So just changing our diet somewhat so that the amount of unprocessed foods we eat is increased can help significantly increase our health and well-being. And aspects, especially in relation to 
breast cancer and taking HRT, reducing and stopping smoking, alcohol intake, caffeine intake is really important to help reduce our risk and also optimizing calcium and vitamin D consumption like we already discussed is really important too. In relation to counseling for hormone replacement therapy, your GP will talk to you about how it works, the benefits of using it, and this is really important to, to do in conjunction with our lifestyle changes. We'll also talk about the side effects of hormones and what to watch out for and what to expect as time goes on. And we'll also talk to you about the risks um, and discuss increased breast awareness and then breast screening. And also by attending for cervical smears to reduce our risk of cervical cancer. They'll also discuss how periods can come back if the periods have been gone for a period of time in the menopausal period. When we stay, start HRT, the periods come back, can come back for a period of three to six months and they'll also discuss the need for contraceptive during this period of time. And if we need contraception, maybe taking the oral contraceptive pill, if that's appropriate, might be a better way of addressing the perimenopausal symptoms than taking HRT, because it'll also give us contraceptive cover. And as before, a marina coil can be a great option for covering both. And because in that period of our life, we're less, we have less fertility than when we're younger, condoms and the diaphragm might be acceptable as forms of contraceptive for you. So when you're started on HRT, the follow-up that you will receive from your GP usually happens three months after starting HRT. And then when you're feeling that your symptoms have settled and you're on an appropriate dose and way of taking hormone replacement therapy, then you'll be seen on a yearly basis. You may repeat the symptom questionnaire that you filled in at the onset. and This can be useful to help us to understand how our symptoms are improving over time. And maybe depending on whether we were started with a by mouth preparation or not, it may be changed to the patch or the gel because the risks of clot are lower with those preparations. There can be a discussion about vaginal symptoms and whether there's a need for topical estrogens and whether there's a need for vaginal moisturizers or lubrication. If we're experiencing symptoms of reduced libido, there may be a need for testosterone therapy. Um, this can be given via a gel which is rubbed into the thigh. Um, at the moment in Ireland, only the testosterone that's licensed for men is, is available to us. Um, and what we do is use a tenth of a male dose every day for a woman, which is about the size of a pea um, on our hand that we rub into our leg. It's important that we discuss how the testosterone can have a negative impact on us. Um, and to make sure that we're not taking too much, the testosterone levels should be, start, should be checked before we started and also six weeks after we started. It's also important to discuss our bleeding pattern. And if we have an abnormal bleeding pattern, it shouldn't last for anything longer than six months. And if it does, we need to be assessed by the gynecology team in the hospital. Blood pressure and weight will be checked again. And then depending on what our symptoms are, we may have a breast exam done or a pelvic exam done at that point. So this is our take home. HRT started early under the age of 60 and within 10 years of our last period during this window opportunity can reduce illnesses. And it also effectively treats our symptoms. If we develop symptoms of the menopause before age 51, it's important that we are started on HRT to protect us from illnesses. And during this period of time, there are no extra risks to us. HRT should only be used in conjunction with optimal lifestyle management, where we look to reduce our risks of other diseases through lifestyle changes. HRT is rarely contraindicated. And when it is, we can refer people to the complex menopause clinics. All GPs can manage women presenting with symptoms of the perimenopause and the menopause. And just to end on some resources, 
We have a Facebook page called the Irish Menopause and patients who are part of this Facebook page find it hugely informative. And in fact, I've learned a lot from my patients through this Facebook page. And there's also a Twitter page that they're on as well. Dr. Louise Newsom is a GP in England who is an expert in management of the menopause and perimenopause. Her website has wonderful patient information leaflets and it's hugely beneficial. There's also an English website called Menopause Matters. And then the British Menopause Society has a lot of information on it too. So thank you for watching today. And if ever you feel the need to discuss the symptoms of the perimenopause and the menopause with your GP, please reach out and visit your GP. We're there to help and keen to help you navigate this period of our lives, which can be difficult and which can be helped. Thank you very much.